uh, Dr. Obadullah has many years of research under his belt, and especially in Islamic social capital. So without further ado, I, I pass over to Dr. Obadullah. I think you have to unmute your uh, microphone, Dr. Obadullah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, a very good day to all the panelists and the participants. Uh, thank you, Dr. Habib, for uh, uh, bringing it to the fore the, the, the quantum of uh, resources that are needed for uh, infrastructure financing and also highlighting and underlining the need for Islamic finance and uh, as well as Islamic social finance uh, to try to address this uh, huge gap. Now, in my presentation, I would, uh, uh, I would be focusing on uh, Islamic social finance, uh, the various tools of uh, institutions of Islamic social finance, and to, uh, as uh, we might, uh, you know, uh, very correctly presume that uh, Islamic social finance institutions are uh, primarily geared towards addressing or creating social infrastructure. And of course, micro at a micro level or at a macro level, but primarily we're talking we're not talking about the mega uh, infrastructure projects uh, or economy uh, economic infrastructure as Dr. Habib uh, uh, described it. Uh, we are basically looking at the 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 role of uh, Islamic social finance institutions and instruments in addressing uh, social infrastructure needs. Now, when we talk about Islamic social finance, primarily we are talking about zakat and sadaqa and uh, uh, awqaf, and also and those instruments in Islamic finance which are not for profit, like qardi hasana, kafala, and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm not uh, getting into the details of it. I, I presume that we are all aware of these instruments and uh, these institutions, and uh, uh, we will take up uh, in slight greater detail uh, when we when we talk about the institutions and their potential to meet the infrastructure needs. Now, since these are, uh, you know, the Islamic institutions are obviously, like any other Islamic uh, instrument, uh, they're essentially, they, they, they try to address the maqasid, the sharia, like any other Islamic institution. And uh, the difference is that here we are talking about in institutions or instruments which are primarily rooted in benevolence and uh, they are also sustainable in impact. And I would like to underline this aspect because uh, if you're talking about donations, these are largely seen as random uh, you know, inflows. Uh, for any institution that is, that is collecting donations, we see them as random uh, you know, flows. Uh, in contrast to that, when we're talking about Islamic uh, charity or Islamic philanthropic uh, flows, uh, like uh, you know, zakat-driven flows or sadaqah-driven flows, then we are actually looking at, uh, uh, you know, very little randomness there. There's a great degree of seasonality. There's a great degree of sustainability there. And uh, because year after year, we have, uh, there is enough evidence now to come to this conclusion that those uh, zakat institutions which collect zakat year after year, and they are seen to be credible in the eyes of the population, then they hardly have uh, witnessed any major fluctuation in their zakat inflows. So, uh, on the contrary, you find that they have been growing rather steadily, and uh, the growth rate uh, is somewhat, uh, you know, is quite predictable and also quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite uh, encouraging for such institutions to, to not only to, to, to meet their, uh, you know, the commitment of resources on the projects to which they're committed, but also to, to take up new products. And specifically, uh, when we talk about the institution of work for Islamic endowments, they are also seen as a mechanism to correct market anomalies. Why? Because they compete with privately supplied goods and services in the market. And, uh, you know, by setting a benchmark price or a benchmark quality, they can always look forward to correcting such anomalies, if at all there is any their price quality anomalies. <clears throat> Now, these institutions certainly, uh, uh, they, they, they uh, are aligned with the Maqasid al-Sharia and they have a very important role in the Islamic vision of development. Uh, we have seen, uh, we have, uh, uh, many of us are, uh, are aware of uh, the Islamic uh, vision as it is uh, captured by different Maqasid of Sharia, different objectives of Sharia. And uh, 
generally we talk about, you know, if you talk about Al-Ghazali's uh, framework, then we talk about these five dimensions that the Sharia seeks to protect and nurture. Uh, uh, faith, uh, that is uh, deen, human self, nafs, intellect, athal, posterity, nasal, and wealth. So these are the five uh, broad uh, classification, uh, five broad classes of objectives that our scholars uh, agree that Sharia tries to, to, to accomplish. So all those institutions are also essentially uh, they aim to achieve the same objectives. Now, this basic framework of five maqasid has again been elaborated upon or expanded by different Islamic economists. And just to give you a, a, a flavor of uh, what our scholars have been talking about, uh, if, you, if, if you take the framework as uh, in, the, in, the, in the writings of Dr. Umar Chapra, he has identified 39 secondary objectives to go with these five primary objectives. And what you have before you are 13 corollaries for just the, one of the objectives, which is nurturing of human self. And here you can see that it also talks about education, it talks about good governance, it talks about removal of, removal of poverty, and employment, self-employment opportunities, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, against this, uh, you know, backdrop of Makas the Sharia and what it wants us to do, uh, if you look around, we find that, you know, there is a huge, uh, you know, uh, problem that is staring at us to our policymakers, especially in the field of infrastructure. You can see that uh, what is the uh, what is the you know gravity of the crisis when he talks about uh, when we talk about access to safe drinking water, or we talk about access to education and so on and so forth. So uh, now these indicators, in a way, have led to the formulation of the SDG framework. Uh, you have already been introduced by Dr. Habib to the different. Uh, to the 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, which again capture uh, some of the Makasid the Sharia. And uh, we, there have been studies to map one on to, uh, to the other. Uh, one is Sustainable Development Goals, of, of course, they capture the concerns of our policymakers across the globe, whereas Makasid the Sharia are there for us to guide uh, till eternity how our resources should be utilized towards achievement of this Makasid. Now, if you compare the two, uh, uh, bringing them together, what we find generally is that uh, SDGs and the Makasid the Sharia, there is a better alignment in the context of economic needs. When we're talking about income and livelihood, work, food, uh, water and sanitation, shelter, healthcare, education, uh, these are all, uh, and for building and maintaining an infrastructure for addressing these needs. So this is where they, they, they align or there is a better alignment. Now, looking at Zakat as an institution of Islamic social finance, uh, <clears throat> now all of us know uh, the, the, uh, the Zakat as a compulsory uh, payment and uh, mandated by the Sharia. Now, here, uh, the point I would like to drive at very briefly is that Zakat funds are not only sustainable, uh, as empirical evidence has uh, shown, and uh, again, by their very nature, Zakat has to be paid annually, by all Muslims or eligible Muslims. And then uh, <clears throat> they can also be used for infrastructure according to uh, uh, some of our leading Islamic scholars uh, to the extent that these beneficiaries are from these infrastructure, they are poor. So which means they, 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 they belong to one of the eight asnaf or eligible categories according to the Sharia. So you can create infrastructure for income and livelihoods, you can create for work, food, water sanitation, shelter, healthcare, education, and so on and so forth, as long as the beneficiaries are poor. So Zakat has this uh, sort of uh, uh, constraint that uh, <clears throat> you can create infrastructure uh, as long as they're meant for the poor. Uh, for the rich, again, uh, you know, you have to ensure that, uh, you know, if, if, they're, if they're benefiting from this infrastructure, uh, they are charged at a rate which corresponds to the market rate. So, so uh, a, a school, for example, it can always cater to poor students who qualify for zakat and uh, exempt them from paying fees. But the same school can offer services to 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 uh, children uh, of the the rich and not so poor and who don't qualify for zakat, and all, always charge them at a market rate. So, uh, zakat funds can always be with proper uh, segregation. 
uh, from the other sources of funds can be seen as a source of funds for with these qualifiers for creating infrastructure. Work in contrast has, uh, is much more, uh, I would say, uh, you know, there is uh, much greater flexibility with respect to WAF, which is by definition creates sustainable uh, benefits, sustainable opportunities, and uh, it all depends on what is the intention of the WAF or the donor, the endowment. Uh, if it is a intention of the WAF to create infrastructure, then OCAF can always be utilized OCAF funds, whether they're in the form of, uh, uh, you know, direct infrastructure or physical infrastructure, or whether they're in the form of investment work, which means you basically, uh, you know, invest the work resources in, uh, let's say, private properties or income generating properties, and the income out of that is it can be utilized for different, uh, you know, Makasita Sharia or for different, uh, you know, SDGs. But they can also be directly utilized uh, to the extent their physical assets uh, are there in, in OCAF. Uh, they can always be utilized directly for creating infrastructure. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, you know, uh, if you can look at uh, the history of OCAF, we know that OCAF has a very rich history. But uh, to just uh, to, to give a brief uh, uh, you know, a glimpse into uh, what our, uh, you know, what uh, history has for us in the institution of Okaf. Uh, now, it is a very well-known quote, talks about Ottoman Okaf, which uh, Ottomans were the uh, most developed in the in, in utilization of Okaf for creating infrastructure. In fact, it was said that people during this era, they were born in work property, they were educated in work schools, worked in work enterprises, received, uh, you know, medical care and treatment in work hospitals and were buried in work flats. So it was a cradle to grave solution offered by the Ottoman Okaf. In fact, uh, we did a very quick study of some of the documented Okaf and you have the distribution before you that how they are, uh, you know, the social priorities though there have been some changes, but essentially they have remained same. They seek to address very similar concerns and you can see how the work uh, during the Ottoman era, it was, they were distributed among the different SDGs. Now here are some good examples uh, of how the OCAF infrastructure, uh, you know, OCAF uh, institution created infrastructure for various uh, purposes, which can be related to the SDGs, taking care of orphans or uh, taking care of hunger or providing healthcare and so on and so forth. These are some of the real OCAF before you, and they are also been classified uh, based on the, the SDGs that they seek to address. Here you have for again, uh, for creating work and livelihood, and also for directly for infrastructure also, you have SDG 9, providing transportation in the river and emergency aid chip, infrastructure services. So some of the Ottoman Okaf, they directly addressed the infrastructure related concern, and indirectly they try to create infrastructure for other SDGs as well. And this is again in relation to, 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 to uh, Istanbul city itself, that you can see that SDG 11, uh, you know, these OCAF, they, they, they try to address various need, uh, needs uh, related to providing, uh, you know, inclusive, uh, for inclusive cities or for providing shelter and for uh, maintenance of the city and its infrastructure. So you have a beautiful example of uh, this, uh, this whole list of uh, OCAF from the Ottoman era which were addressing the infrastructure needs in the city of Istanbul. <clears throat> now next, I would like to take you very quickly to uh, be a short of time. So uh, allow me to, to take you through uh, some of the contemporary OCAF. Now we have seen the Ottoman OCAF, but what is happening around us as of now? Are we, uh, you know, addressing how to what extent they address the SDGs, to what extent they address the social needs, have the social needs changed? And what is the, what is the current status? So what we have before you is again, not a very comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence before you or the results before you, but based on a, a survey of uh, the internet websites of the OCAF institutions and to, to the extent these are covered by, the, they are represented on the web. So we find some uh, very good examples of, uh, you know, SDGs uh, being addressed in the form of orphan care. And you, get, you, you, you see the impressive numbers there. That, uh, that which relates to Pakistan, India, the Indian continent, 
and Pakistan, you know, and uh, Indonesia uh, as well. So, uh, you know, uh, the contemporary Omkhaf, they, they do give a lot of importance to orphan care. And when we talk about SDG3, again, there are some very interesting examples of uh, interesting models. Uh, in Malaysia, you have the corporate waqf, and also Tur Turkey was the earliest example of corporate waqf. And uh, they, they, they are known for their waqf hospitals, uh, where the poor and the needy, they, they get health care at a very, very nominal cost. Uh, you have very good examples also in Pakistan, Shavkat Khanam Cancer Hospital, in this hospital, and so on and so forth. Uh, in India as well. And in Indonesia, interestingly, you have uh, the, uh, the hospitals being financed through Okaf. But uh, one specific example that, you'd be, that would be covered in one of the subsequent sessions is the use of resources from cash waqflink sukuk uh, for uh, you know, uh, meeting the hospital rate, uh, meeting the needs of Ahmed Wardi Ike Hospital. Uh, again, education, we have some interesting numbers for basic Islamic education. And of course, uh, if we're talking about uh, higher education, there are equally impressive uh, institutions which are, uh, which are created out of uh, Omkhaf, uh, Wakhflan, they were built on Wakhflan, and then <clears throat> they were developed uh, to, to house uh, many modern universities. But talking about Islamic education itself, basic Islamic education, you can see that there is a huge uh, micro-level infrastructure that is, uh, that is delivering the, the services, that is delivering the goods. And uh, we have, uh, these are some of the numbers which were tentatively, uh, which were collected from uh, different sources. And uh, yeah, the last one that I would uh, just like to highlight is the Indonesian one, which uh, we have more than 20,000 uh, know, Islamic boarding school, uh, schools. But what is interesting about this is a new push for building local economies around the, such Islamic boarding schools. The Santran is, is uh, basically, it means the Islamic boarding school in Bacha, Indonesia. And uh, we find a lot of business activities, and this is an ongoing process. And a lot of new activities every other day you hear about it, a new experiment. So uh, this, uh, you know, uh, whether they're in the form of small shops or they're in the form of, uh, uh, you know, different other economic activities, these are being undertaken, agricultural and, and development activities on the agricultural waqf land. They are, you know, uh, they all center around or using the Islamic boarding schools as the nucleus of the local economy. And in fact, a, a very large percentage of the Okaf we find, uh, especially the international ones, they're, they're, they're very much focused on providing water. And you have the ex examples before you. And in Turkey and, uh, uh, you know, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, and so on and so forth, you have all these Okaf, they are very much into digging wells. And uh, some are uh, very, very dedicated to this one cause alone, like uh, in, in ACT in Indonesia and in IHH in Turkey. Uh, basically, they, they have been uh, the major players in provision of water. And, they, and again, you have here some interesting examples of uh, an infrastructure, a transport infrastructure waqf, which was funded with cash uh, waqf link Sukuk in Malaysia. Uh, it built the uh, Wanka Blarkin Central Bus Terminal. And uh, we don't have time to really uh, to get into the details of this uh, very elegant structures, very interesting structures. But we have also seen examples of uh, other similar experiments uh, in different parts of the world, uh, like, for example, schools for disabled or use of solar work for orphans in Bangladesh. And you have uh, an interesting example of environment-friendly burial services in Indonesia. So uh, basically, these are examples of uh, uh, <clears throat> how the institution of work is being used and uh, more, with greater awareness, uh, we find that uh, you know there's a greater and uh, uh, larger use of the institution of WAF for these different uh, you know uh, SDGs or different addressing different social needs. Uh, and here is the last slide that I would like to end my presentation with, uh, which is uh, some of the contemporary of CAF are also very active in seeking to provide work and livelihood. And uh, for example, you have here. Uh, skill Enhancement and Assistance Program, which comes under SDG 8.5, and SDG 5 is for Women Empowerment. 
So you have very uh, different types of skill enhancement activities being undertaken by different OCAF across the globe. Uh, you have some OCAF dedicated to leadership skills, uh, and also some try to provide micro infrastructure in the form of shop lots in terms of uh, micro trader uh, you know, schemes. They try to help young Muslims to, to help to set up their own micro enterprises or trading enterprises. And for this, again, funding is available through uh, you know, different microfinance programs run by some of the OCAF. You have the example of, uh, again, uh, Johor Corporation Malaysia, uh, international, uh, you know, IICO and uh, ACT. These are that they have all been very active in trying to, you know, provide micro capital and try to to uh, sort of mainstream micro businesses, especially in the context of the pandemic. We have seen there are examples of OCAF institutions coming forward and then seeking to rejuvenate the small shop owners by providing micro capital. So I would uh, stop here and. Uh, uh, the question association, I look forward to it, where we can perhaps address some of the challenges and uh, what could be the strategic solutions for the OCAF and Zakat uh, sector in particular and the Islamic social finance sector in general. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.